Welcome to the second edition of Talking Bread Books, the monthly conversation series by Left Word in collaboration with NewsClick. For today's episode on students and struggle, we have Shadrupa Chakrabarti and Pindiga Ambedkar, editors of Students Won't Be Quiet, and Nitish Narayanan and Dipsi Dadar, editors of Education or Exclusion, The Plight of Indian Students, in conversation with Vikas Raval, author and professor of economics, Jawaharlal Nehru University. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to discuss these two very interesting books, which uh, um, both of which deal with uh, the problems that uh, students and uh, the whole system of public education has been facing over the last few years. Uh, this These problems have originated from a systematic assault on uh, democratic functioning of higher education institutions on, in p- particular, an assault on public education uh, designed to be inclusive, on the inclusive character of, of public education in uh, reaching out to the students in particular from marginalized sections of the society. Uh, the assaults of the, the assault on this system of public education has many dimensions, and these books uh, are an extremely important uh, record of uh, of the struggles that uh, students have uh, have uh, fought valiantly. Um, these two books provide uh, both uh, an analytical uh, discussion of the struggles that have happened but also of the issues. Now, uh, I suggest that uh, we start with uh, Shatrupa Chakravarti. Let me first ask you, you know, uh, to, to give us a brief of what this book is about and why why, do, why did you get into this uh, writing of this book? I would first like to uh, highlight the fact that, you know, uh, you have such a title called Students Won't Be Quiet. And it itself is a kind of uh, drawback. And probably today, we don't have many publishers who would be comfortable to publish a book like this with such a title. So here comes actually the kind of politics that we all uh, have been uh, into. And we want that politics to uh, extend uh, for the future generation also to take up. Now, coming to this book, uh, all of us know the kind of situation in which we have been going through, particularly uh, after 2014, when there was a change in uh, the power in center. And uh, it was said at that point of time that uh, the aspiring youth is basically uh, have been the backbone of the change of this power. But when it comes to uh, the change and the result of the change, we see that the first attack happens on the students. And uh, uh, it was in a manner in which it actually fundamentally uh, kind of stopped many of the students from even aspiring to come to higher education. So the first attack really was on the fellowship. And then we see the series of attack continues on fee hike and, you know, the larger agenda of privatization creeping into uh, the public institutions and so on. Now, uh, one of the major factors during this change is that how this agenda, which was basically an agenda uh, that could not have given any benefit to the government, was actually turned against the students uh, with the issue of nationalism. And uh, at this point of tri- uh, time, uh, they actually try to make it uh, almost like that students uh, have never been into uh, the frontal struggle. Students have not done anything to save their education, which was basically uh, of, uh, like, you know, uh, to bringing the falsehood that students were never a participant in the student politics and so on and so forth. So this period, we identify through this book as a um, assault really on reason and thought, uh, on knowledge, on public education, 
and on various issues that actually enhances our uh, institutions, uh, an institution uh, where the students uh, and teachers and the whole academic community are to participate to, you know, uh, to, 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 to take part in this uh, system of knowledge. Uh, so we have highlighted many issues that have come during this uh, particular period uh, where the attack was there uh, with systematic exclusion of uh, students from the marginalized communities. There was large scale violence on many uh, st women students who uh, were in different public institutions. And there was no uh, sort of, uh, you know, institutional mechanism uh, to deal with those uh, issues and so on and so forth. But the main point is that if we as a student, or uh, you know, uh, if we as students, we are not organized to uh, fight for our issues, our basic rights like fees, like fellowship uh, and so on, the nature of campus itself uh, gets highly depoliticized and, uh, you know, the democratic nature of campus uh, just uh, goes into a toss. So it is in a way that the students in this particular period have really put up their fight to save the democracy and what is there uh, in the country's constitution. So, you know, to begin with, I would say that, you know, this struggle was very important that Occupy UGC, which continued for 90 days, and where, uh, you know, uh, we know the nature of the government, how adamant the government was and so on. Uh, uh, but, you know, this student struggle have kind of put the government into back foot. And that was the, I mean, we know recently the farmers' agitation has happened and it has, uh, you know, kind of put up that sort of a uh, challenge before the government. But uh, before that, if we can really recount that the students were actually uh, one of the major counters for the kind of policies and the kind of actions that the government had taken. So Occupy UGC, of course, and then this whole uh, narrative uh, around the period of 2016 when uh, the student community and the universities were highly uh, criminalized through, uh, you know, by use of false narrative, by use of the Godi media, and, you know, all sorts of, you know, machineries that the state had. Uh, the students really stood up. And uh, when it comes to, say, universities like Hyderabad Central University, JNU, uh, Jadapur, uh, and many of, many of those universities during that particular uh, time, all the students have actually rallied on their demands and it was not an easy fight because when you go to the street and you know you get branded as anti-national uh, by you know the so-called common people it's not an easy fight the students were being beaten up on the streets on those uh, you know false narratives but uh, the kind of struggle that was built up through, uh, you know, various dialogue, the process that has happened, taking along the larger society, the teachers, the, you know, the Karamchari associations and so on and so forth. Uh, I think that it sets an example of uh, uh, our time that uh, the united struggle, the nature of the struggle that it was united, it kind of opened up newer and more possibilities for, uh, you know, defending democracy and constitution, which was under attack and the public uni university and public education system. Uh, may I now uh, sort of request Ambedkar, if he can come in and talk about particularly about, uh, you know, how, uh, what was the importance of issues related to exclusion in particular in these struggles, you know, how, uh, you know, the Rohit formula thing happened, uh, Najib, uh, disappearance of Najib happened in JNU and, and in many other institutions, there were, there have been uh, specific cases of problems faced by students from the, the marginalized sections of the society. And uh, um, the book actually quite, very, is, is, does a very good uh, and important documentation of how uh, these have been an integral part of the struggles that, that in fact, perhaps the most important part of 
of the the issues that struggle uh, the students are fighting so shatrupa had given a context of how we thought about this book and the reason why different universities were up and protesting because the conditions were so bad that the government was clamping on critical voices and where funds were required it was not releasing uh, fellowships on time and there was a massive fee hike and also the government uh, proudly used to say beti bachao beti padao but uh, if you see in this book that it is the administration itself was complicit in uh, seeing that uh, the issues of uh, gender discrimination were prevalent and there were no measures that were taken by the administration to arrest those uh, problems faced by women students so in this book we have covered about the issues of fee hike the issues of fellowship the issues of uh, first generation students facing discrimination in uh, universities the issues of uh, women students facing uh, discrimination or harassment while uh, going to their classes and also we have talked about uh, the struggles that students led for having necessary infrastructure so that they can have pursue their uh, higher education with dignity yeah like professor vikas talked about that uh, i should focus on uh, or touch upon the issues of uh, social exclusion faced by first generation students from marginalized backgrounds see uh, everybody is aware of the problems and the conditions that students in hyderabad central university especially rohit vemula and others were put which ultimately led to the institutional murder of rohit vemula why i why we thought that it is an institutional murder shatrupa and i felt because if you see the conditions there was a classic example of how the administration had passed a circular that students the suspended students were not supposed to have access to their hostel and were not allowed to have access to any interaction with the rest of the students that was nothing but a caste dictat that happens in rural areas where the kaf panchayat the passes a resolution stating that a so and so family is boycotted and all the social and economic relations are to be cut off which way pushes them to the starvation similarly in hcu the rohit vemula agitation was precisely that that students voice their opinion against the rss kind of educational interference uh, in the higher educational institution and the abvp students violence on students from the ambedkar students association and also uh, screening a documentary about the issues in uh, muzaffar nagar that happened and what did the administration do because of complaint uh, lodged the administration uh, from the ministry of uh, human resources which was then called mhrd sent a circular to the vice chancellor stating that anti national activities were happening what were these anti national activities students were engaging in critical knowledge production what is the otherwise what is the purpose of a higher education other than talk about issues that affect our society and how to make our society better so that but the ruling dispensation didn't like it and through the abvp it's a student wing of the rss clamped and uh, created violence and the administration was used to suspend the students it was in this background that the students had to face lot of hardships but we must remember that if you see in this book that students fought bravely and countered the administration point by point and ensured that the voices of social justice and access to quality education with dignity was preserved in hyderabad central university and if you see all the students they successfully uh finish their higher education most of them have joined uh, as faculty so we know that uh, if given an opportunity students from marginalized backgrounds thrive well 
and that is one prime example another struggle i would want to talk about on fee hike because we all are talking i mean we all are aware about how neoliberal policies have affected even the higher educa- education system but i just want to highlight about the issue in tata institute of social sciences one of the premier uh, institutes for uh, masters and undergraduate students where uh, students were provided till recently good education with very subsidized education uh, fees however because of the ugc cutting down on the funds to uh, the tata institute students from scst obc background and even from the general category background who used to get uh, student aid were put under a lot of hardships but the students were not quiet rightly they did very important thing about studying the fee hike the background of it and how and did provide a solution the students analyzed and found that if the government supported them with about 100 uh, uh, 1 crore to 3 crore uh, rupees per year the problems of the fee hike that was severely affecting the students from deprived economically deprived and socially deprived backgrounds could have been sorted but that was not the case the administration did not listen to the students they severely clamped down on the students in bombay campus in hyderabad campus and they went to such an extent that uh, they had to discontinue certain programs because they felt that the students were not being uh, uh discipline so called discipline enough because they were watching their problems what else will students do if uh, if you are not given an opportunity to sit in a classroom and study first thing you will ask is give me a right so that i can go and study in the hostel every time uh, you you hear in the news media the students are unruly they are uh, making noise without studying but if you see the if you read the document if you see this agitation you will see that the first thing the students of the student federation of india did was every hostel they went in the state they studied the problems faced by students and as a first measure they petitioned the district collectors they didn't go on strike they petitioned the district collectors stating that these are the problems please ensure that these uh, uh, issues are sorted out but we know that the governments which are functioning under neoliberal uh, dictates don't care for providing facilities so that the students can pursue their education but the students were not quiet then from each district they mobilized and on one final day in uh, the c- capital city of uh, then undivided andhra pradesh about with thousands of students protested at the assembly that protest was so huge that different sections of the society came forward to give their solidarity with that massive struggle and the support of the general population the students achieved a massive massive uh, uh, victory the government was forced to increase their fellowship of uh, recruit hostel wardens across the state have special hostels in uh, different uh, areas provide uh, for engineering students uh, uh, higher education degree students so and so forth so the students federation of india has a golden uh, uh, victory in form of studying and struggling and that's one struggle that uh, we had documented in the book it's an interesting point you made about how some of these very important and crucial things of of student life you know access to education access to to facilities to live fellowships to cover books and and your your basic minimum needs and so on which one would take for granted are actually uh, things that have been achieved through struggles and these are not simple things that have just been handed by the state at this yes. moment can i since dipshita uh, is with us only for 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 a brief while can i call upon her to uh, give us a quick sort of overview of of the other book the 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 sub subtitle of the book is the plight of indian student what's the plight about 
what are the key key factors so i just uh, briefly talk about uh, what professor vikas rawal was talking about that uh, and what actually ambedkar was talking about uh, that how the policy how the neoliberal policy how this government has uh, ensured through the new education policy and the uh, the kind of uh, policy that that they were uh, coming up even before the new education policy that primarily uh, cuts down uh, educational right and makes it a commodity if you are going to look in the the, the new education policy the draft policy and after the revision the, the law that they have come up with uh, it primarily telling it on a case that education is not going to be considered as a right education is going to be considered as something that people can buy so just like uh, how you go to a market and the person with more money can buy a better good and the person with lesser money is going to buy a, a you know a, a commodity or a good which is not as great quality as the one that the rich is buying they are making education the same a commodity if you're going to look into all the regime all the government that came uh, post 90s all of them were built upon this idea that the government the state is not going to uh, say that education is my responsibility state responsibility they're going to slowly give it uh, up to the market if you're going to look into the first uh, five uh, you know the five years planning we will see somehow the new uh, government the new state the independent uh, india then was trying to um, tell that education uh, somehow is going to be a state responsibility we are seeing the kind of funding that they were uh, putting in education we are seeing at least in paper the government is coming and saying about universal education and uh, some of this vision was there and since india has been under the colonial rule where education again was uh, not something which was universally available only the elites only the people with money uh, could get into the modern education before that uh, india was a feudal a caste society where education was nothing uh, but only a social capital that could be owned by the people from the upper caste and the male uh, from the upper caste so when the new uh, india was formed when the modern india was formed uh, somehow this idea was there that you have to decentralize uh, you have to democratize education as a social capital so that the kind of discrimination that has happened for last centuries uh, can be tackled i think the idea was also there because since we are talking about a modern state this is not a princely state uh, this is not a not, not a religious state this is the modern state uh, which brings in the idea of a of a modern citizen a modern citizen can be only built if he or she or if they are given the right to education the right to universal education or the right to equal access to education so from then uh, from 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 uh, thinking education not only as a, a, about knowledge production but also facilitate democracy to now in 2019 when they see education as nothing but a tool for uh, further suppression if you are going to look into the education policy that we are talking about you know uh, that from the class 6 onwards there is going to be vocational training professor sachidanand sinha who has also written a chapter here he argues that this is nothing but new brahmanism who are going to take part uh, in this vocational activity the people of the working caste uh, who are predominantly the working class the shudra they were the one who could do the you know the physical labor if their children if, if those family sending their children to school because they are aspiring for a mobility a mobility which is occupational a mobility which is societal a mobility which is economic as well so when you go and say that from plastics onwards you have to do the vocational work who are going to take all those vocational uh, you know all those vocational practices at the upper class at the upper class they are going to do or again these people the working caste for whom education was nothing but a tool for mobility and a change they are again forced for the similar kind of job that their parents are doing for centuries so i think it is uh, very important to locate the new education policy and its uh, fallouts are uh, not only with the new liberal regime are uh, not only how it commodified but also how it uh, affect the people who are already been discriminated the people who are already been marginalized if you are going to look into national education policy you will see they are talking about you know curtailing down the funds for the sst sst hostel for the girls hostel scholarship for the sst scholarship for sst the scholarship for the uh, women they have cut down the uh, the uh, pre matriculation scholarship for the sst girl they have cut down the uh, post doctoral fellowship for the women and if you are there are one chapter that we have written with our fellow indian researcher uh, comrade sorshan sohum 
where we have seen that how uh, due to this uh, lockdown, the women were affected most. Because when a woman leaves their home and they come to a hostel, for the first time they're considered as individual. Till the time she's in her home, she's part of her family unit, her gender roles are very specific, her domestic roles are very specific. But the moment she's entering into a university, the moment she has her own space in form of a hostel, from a unit of her uh, family, from a gender labor unit from of her family, she's becoming an individual, where she don't have to do a certain kind of work, where men and women both have the similar kind of job description inside the hostel. So when the hostels were closed down during the pandemic, a lot of women were sent back to their home. A lot of women were married off. A lot of women had to, you know, uh, they, they got pregnant and they became mother in very early age. So the problem, the fallout of national education policy is multi pronged Because it has been the experience of this regime that the students, particularly from the marginalized section, the working class, when they came to the university, they have started questioning their disprivileges. They have started questioning the state. They have started questioning the discrimination that they're facing for centuries, for generations. And it is those questions, it is those thoughts, it is those critical thinking that has been challenging the government again and again intellectually. So if they can break down, if they can capture the higher education, if they can decide and dictate that what kind of research you're going to do, so what they will essentially do is actually stop, is actually kill uh, that critical thinking. So by uh, you know increasing the fee, by ensuring that there are multiple entry points and exit points, by ensuring there are multiple entrance examinations to get into the higher education, what they're trying to do is limit uh, the education, the higher education, and that actually goes back to what Manu has taught. Manu has believed that education has to be a very exclusive commodity for the upper class men. Uh, Manu has thought that if education, uh, if, if the Shudra and the woman can hear of even a single word of the faith, there should be more than less put into his or her ear because the Manu believes education or knowledge and social capital has to be accumulated, has to be captured by the minuscule privilege of this society. So what the national education policy does is basically uh, re-ensuring uh, what the teaching of Manu is, uh, reinforcing the teaching of Manu, is ensuring that education remains as an occluded, exclusive knowledge. It remains as an exclusive social capital and the democratization of knowledge and the process of uh, you know citizen making, the process of democratizing this country, which is fastest, which is patriarchal, is stopped through uh, the, the, the stopping of higher education. If I look at what so far Shatrupa, Ambedkar and Dipshita have talked about, I think there are two sets of things that characterize the nature of assault and what the students have been fighting against. One is the whole issue of uh, undermining democratic character of uh, public education, in particular through sort of authoritarianism, but in particular also through undermining access of underprivileged students. The other is, uh, you know, uh, facilitating penetration of markets, commodification of education, uh, undermining uh, education as a right, undermining uh, subsidized or free public education, and opening up spaces for privatization of delivery of education and uh, delivery of education as a commodity uh, through uh, sort of uh, uh, spaces that are curated, uh, opened and curated for, for private institutions, private universities and, and engineering colleges and, and so on and so forth to, to capture. And that is sort of uh, promotion of privatization of higher education has happened in just so many ways. Indeed. So, you know, what started as an assault on democratic character of uh, higher education institution has now gone into an assault that's actually, uh, uh, you know, an assault on their very existence uh, or a, an assault on their, their uh, position in the whole system of education and creating spaces for private uh, institutions. In this whole uh, sequence, as Dipshita pointed out, is also the whole, uh, uh, you know, what happened during the COVID pandemic, the way uh, public uh, universities and, and education institutions were kept shut for, for such a long period of time. In fact, you know, as, as all of us have, have 
have, have noticed uh, uh, you know markets and shops and cinema halls open but schools and universities were kept shut you know the the impact that had on access of um, of marginalized uh, sections of society to education uh, and and the loss that uh, uh, has happened because of that is is almost unrepairable now that has also uh, sort of taken us into a phase where you know these glorious struggles that were happening prior to covid pandemic uh, there's perhaps a, some kind of a weakening that has happened uh, uh, and and in this i think the way the dynamics of uh, student organizations works is somewhat different from others because you know students who were fighting and in fact continue to fight in fact uh, a point that comes out quite uh, vividly in in uh, shatrupa and ambedkar's book is how some of those uh, student activists continue to battle you know not only collectively but also in their personal lives so you know how while the earlier struggles continue collectively and individually uh, there is some kind of an ebb one see so uh, may i now call upon nitish to talk about what is the way forward what is it that that uh, we are where is this going uh, do you see the same kind of struggles uh, continuing and if so uh, what what is what can be done what is the potential for actually students coming together and mounting this resistance once once again um actually uh, india had a, a huge legacy of uh, vibrant student movement which begins from the time of uh, uh, the national movement and the colonial struggle itself so the student movement in india when we uh, trace its history we'll see that in every uh, step of uh, the nation on uh, every juncture the students and campuses have also played a major role contributing to debates and also um, uh, rallying students so mobilizing the public uh, uh, consciousness so awakening the public consciousness towards a uh, democratic society or contributing to to make indian society a more democratic one see we have seen from 1990s especially since the introduction of neoliberal policies to india that uh, the students in india have been one of the the worst affected victims and the education sector to 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 ensure that the students resistance doesn't happen or it doesn't become an obstacle for the government to to pursue their uh, extreme uh, exploitative neoliberal policies to make education as a uh, commodity instead of a right to ensure a right uh, for the students but to make it as a commodity what the government uh, different state governments and also central government in india union government in india from 1990s especially what they were doing was to 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 curb uh, to curtail the democratic rights of students banning student union elections and uh, banning uh, student politics and uh, all kind of things and we have seen for example there was a time in india in every university uh, had huge uh, presence of uh, student movement but uh, this was seen as an obstacle by the ruling class by the government to pursue their anti student policies then they took all um, uh, anti democratic uh, policies laws to ensure that this does uh, remain the same any longer in india that is how student movement was banned in haryana that is how student politics was banned in gujarat andhra himachal pradesh and all those things for example to give one um, one example a university where students did not allow the administration to to increase the fee for almost three decades the the himachal pradesh university in shimla the only option before the the ruling class was to to ban uh, uh, students union election which was happening there for many decades for three three and a half decades that is how the the student union election was banned in uh, 
Himachal Pradesh University in 2013. But uh, interestingly, when we look into the last one decade, especially from the that uh, since the the Narendra Modi government, the first uh, uh, Modi government came to power in 2014, we can also see a revival of student movement in India. That Indian campuses, which till then have seen no or no major appraisals, became center of struggles, be it FTII uh, or be it different IIT campuses and be it, uh, many central universities where even student union election doesn't take place, where students are coming together and um, building a stronger resistance. This is important for students because uh, whenever democracy is attacked, it is also an attack on the future. It is also an attack on the campuses. So that is how the students wage struggles, not only on the, the specific education related issues. For example, when uh, the, uh, the anti-CAA protest period, uh, when the, the CAA was uh, passed and all, the first person who was deported from India was not a Muslim actually. And uh, the first person who was penalized because of, uh, since the, the, uh, the CAA came to being, it was not someone who was, uh, 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 it was nothing to do with the person's religious identity. That was a student who came from Germany to IIT Madras to pursue uh, post-graduation in physics. His name was Jacob Linden there. He participated in a student protest, which was organized by the students in, uh, progressive students in IIT Madras. He joined there and he uh, held a placard in his hand where it was written from 1933 to 45. Uh, we have been there and don't do this. So he was telling India from the experience of Germany that we have gone through such a darkest uh, period in our history and don't you don't follow, you don't do that mistake. He was forced to, uh, to, to, to uh, I mean, discontinue his course and he was deported to Germany. From here, so what is the peculiar character of student movement going on now? It has, I think it is more uh, larger and it demands a more united struggle. United in the sense, not only unity among different sections of students, but the unity among different stakeholders of uh, uh, education, students, teachers, staff, and all. Not only that, um, uh, also a united struggle of students and the, the farmers, workers, uh, unemployed youth, and all. Why? Because, see, there is a pattern of the, the policies which was passed by Narendra Modi government in recent years. You look at everything, be it farmers' law, be it uh, labor code, be it environment law, be it uh, forest act, be it the latest, uh, the, the IT act and all, you will see a kind of draconian character, a colonial smell and content in all of this thing. What was it? It was to ensure that the, the, the people are denied their sovereignty and they are denied access to their resources, the resources in their land, and they are denied the, the right to politically represent themselves to and be part of policy making, which will shape their future and their life. Farmers, uh, uh, the farmers law, in short, it was that it denies the farmers right to decide what to produce, how to produce, where to sell and how to lead their life. Labor court, which um, scraps every single rights the, the workers fought and won over the years in history and making them just means that the puppets of just uh, kind of tools or just wage laborers for the market. So this kind of a, a, a policy we will see everywhere. You look at uh, uh, the new education policy. The aim was to create a new generation which will be trained in a way demanded by the market, which was monopolized, uh, uh, which was, uh, means uh, uh, the monopoly of uh, that market is in the hands of the corporates because they are gaining everything. So it, it is a systematic plan to prepare a generation which will advance the interest of 
the big uh, the corporate sections in india so th this uh, colonial character between the 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 different laws passed which affects different kind of people also pays a way uh, pays a way for the people to come together and build a larger struggle which will highlight the anti colonial spirit and which will also take india to a new future in simple the demand is uh, we sfi students federation of india had organized last year an all india jada which covered some 24 states and visited to hundreds of campuses met thousands of students and all throughout the jada we were telling that so the, the simple demand we are saying that uh, during this jada is we deserve a better life we the indian students deserve a better life when india stands at 107 in uh, in 127 countries in the global hunger index that you don't expect that parents uh, send their children to school because they have nothing to eat and uh, when every once out of four students who joins first standard drops out from education before reaching secondary level that the, the number of students who reach higher secondary level in india is just 55 percentage the number of students who reach higher education which is just after plus two is some uh, 27 percentage the total number of phd scholars in india among the students in higher education is just 0 0.5 percentage this has been the situation in india and there is nothing the new education policy over offer to overcome it but they uh, intensify the the existing the they worsen the existing whatever little is existing in india now the question is to protect the future the question is to protect democratic rights the the question is to protect uh the, the right to live to to fight for a better life there the the possibility of a larger unity and struggles comes is that was very very well expressed i think uh, that's really the crux of where we stand that we have these assaults on uh, democratic character of public institution. We have this whole uh, new assault in the form of new education policy, which is aimed at, uh, you know, uh, uh, commodification of education, uh, uh, creating an education system which is specifically designed to meet the interests of the, 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 the corporate sector and the sort of... Uh, uh, big corporate interests, but also to actually deny uh, fundamental education to to marginalized sections of the society, to 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 the poor, to people from socially deprived communities, and to women. Uh, and I think the importance of continuing the struggle against these assaults cannot be cannot be overemphasized. So, and as Nitish pointed out, that taking this forward, strengthening these struggles requires building solidarities, not only among students, teachers, and, and staff of the uh, educational institutions and, and building solidarities across educational institutions uh, among these stakeholders, but also building solidarities with farmers, with, with, with working people, with, with the unemployed youth, and, and so on. Uh, I think that's really the crux of uh, where we stand and what uh, we hope uh, we will see going forward.